often we view serving society being purposeful as being at the expense of profit. So if a company was to increase its wages, it splits the pie differently. It gives more of the pie to workers, and that must mean there's less around for shareholders. And so indeed, some CEOs run their business trying to make as much profit as possible. And they think the way to do that is to minimize everybody else's slice of the pie. So they pay people little, they charge maximum prices. So the whole idea of grow the pie is that when you are creating value for wider society, you're not just giving up part of profits, you're growing the pie and actually profits become higher as a byproduct. For example, if you treat work as well by paying them more, but not just pay, but by giving them meaningful work and skills development, they become more motivated, more productive, and therefore you create more profit in the long term. So this question of purpose or profit, actually the word or is wrong. It can be purpose and profit. And I think that's really important because when they hear people speak about purpose, they think, well, that sounds great, but really, companies can't just be about saving the dolphins, they need to make money. But here I am as a hard-hearted ex-investment banker, finance professor and saying, well, actually, even from a finance perspective, you should care about purpose because it's something that can actually lead to your company being more successful in the long term. And you might think, well, that sounds sort of great, but it sounds too good to be true. But this is why my role as a finance professor is to look at the evidence and what it shows is that's many, many dimensions of purpose do ultimately lead to the company becoming more successful and delivering more value to shareholders in the long term. I was wondering if you could start by telling us in our audience a little bit about yourself and that whether, whether that's your professional life, your professional identity or your personal identity. Yeah, sure. So thanks so much for, for having me here. So um, my current job is a professor of finance at London Business School, but I haven't always been an academic. So when I was at university, I studied economics. So you might think, well, why did I study that? Um, at high school, I like both arts and sciences. So there were some of my friends who did maths, physics, chemistry, and others did English, history, German. But I liked a mixture of both. And, and so economics, I like being a mixture of both. So it's a social science. So you do have some theories, but the theories aren't set in stone. So people can disagree about them. And so why I like it is that, yes, you can have agreement and disagreement, but it's not purely subjective. You can have some evidence that you can base it from. And so then I studied economics at university. Then I went into the city um, doing um, investment banking at Morgan Stanley, as most people end up doing if they do economics at university. And I like my time at Morgan Stanley. So many people sort of think you get mistreated at an investment bank. I was really lucky to work with some great people. Um, but why did I, I leave? Um, when I was working on a particular deal, I was solving one company's problems at that one time. Whereas as a business school professor, if you write about something, let's say the importance of ethics in business, that can apply to many companies in different industries, and also around the world. And that's why we can have this, this uh, transatlantic and you know, global conversation is that, that the issues that I'm working on are not just UK issues, that they're, they're important in Babson, they're important in Sydney. Fascinating. And um, in terms of your personal identity as well, so obviously you said you were um, an economic student, you said that you were a finance professional and investment banker, then you mentioned now how you're a professor. Um, how would you characterize yourself in your personal life as well? And what would you say um, characterizes Alex Edmonds? Thank you. So, so like I have a personal, I have a professional purpose and a personal purpose. So the professional purpose is to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business. And my personal purpose is to inspire other people to fulfill their potential. And so that's why I like doing um, being an educator as, as my job. Even as a first year analyst at Morgan Stanley, I was lucky that I'd studied economics, while others of my friends were people who'd studied engineering or chemistry. So they weren't so into the finance, so I'd be happy to explain to them why a certain model worked this way. And so this whole idea of, of education is why me at London Business School, I try to do that beyond just the classroom. So one thing I'm really passionate about is the importance of, of physical fitness. And so um, I take my uh, students um, from uh, London Business School to this really hardcore gym called Barry's Boot Camp. So you have some in Sydney, you have some in Boston. And so that I managed to get a budget for. I probably don't have a budget anymore given COVID, but 
but when the times are good I, I got this budget because I think it's really important to get people into important and uh, personal habits and actually just before coming on this um, um, th this this podcast I, I did my own sort of daily workout and I try to do exercise every single day because I think that's really important um, for for just for not not just for physical fitness but also mental wellness as well particularly in the lockdown if you don't have that then you're just going to sit at your desk the entire day yeah for sure and um it's good to hear that you could uh, get involved with your students in that way and i know um the education system is something shasha and i are very passionate about and it's good to hear um i'm not too sure if i, if I would say as a novel uh, method but really getting involved with the students and making it a, a very holistic experience by even exercising with your students to that extent so i'd say um that's very interesting and just to transition to that i was and we were really interested to hear about a, a person in your life that we, when we come across, when we came across your lectures, you would mention with, um, you would mention had an influence on you and her name was Laurie Hodrick. And so could you tell us and our audience a little bit about a doctor or professor Hodrick and her influence on you and all the lessons that you learned from her? Yeah, so she's a professor. She was a professor of finance at Columbia, but also um, she was managing director at Deutsche Bank. So she spanned both academia and industry. And I just got to know her because uh, as an academic, you get invited to give seminars at um, other schools. And in addition to the seminar, you have a stream of office visits with the different faculty members. And we just had an office visit and we completely clicked. And part of it was actually, she was just asking me not about my research, but who I am as a person. And so, that was just really interesting for a finance professor to be some interested in something other than equations and then we seem to share just a lot of um, similar values and beliefs and then when I got back to um, Wharton which is why I was a professor uh, and my home in Philadelphia I, I just looked uh, at the other up the other stuff she'd done and she'd done um, this interview on um, in the Financial Times it was a series called 10 questions where the Financial Times interviewed some leading women in finance. Uh, and that, I would encourage any of your listeners just to, if they want five minutes, read that. Yeah, there's people who say recommend I, this book or that book, but a book takes maybe a weekend to read. This, if you've got five minutes, everybody should read this. And like one of those 10 questions was, what is your greatest lesson learned? And she said, um, you can do everything you want to and be everything you want to be but not all at once. And so why I thought that was so striking is I'm somebody who gets excited about loads of things. So when I was at university, I wanted to do every single sort of club. I love both sports and music and drama and all of those things. Uh, and similarly for me as a professor, I'm not just an academic. I also like doing things like being involved in the real world. But if you try to do so many things at once, you're going to be spread too thinly and not, you're not going to be useful to anybody. And so this is why what I think purposeful or ethical living is, is not trying to solve everybody's problems. That is not your responsibility, but to focus on the problems that you are particularly well placed to serve. For example, I'm very happy to, to, to speak to you, even though you're not part of London Business School, because you share my mission about um, promoting ethical and purposeful living. And that's something I think I have particular expertise in because that's what my research is on. But I have to admit, I don't spend much time with PhD students because that academic interface is something I think any other professor can do. For me, myself, I don't think that's something I have special knowledge of. So I think to be very selective about what you're doing was something that Laurie impressed me. And, and beyond that, um, beyond that, inter that, that interview in the Financial Times, every time I went to New York or to Columbia, we would have a chat. She then ended up moving to Stanford. And when I was giving a talk at Stanford, we had dinner and we talked about some, some further things. So I just think it's great to have somebody that you respect, not just intellectually, but you respect in terms of having great values as a person. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And I suppose that comes to the question because I did read, I have read the article because I've read a couple of, uh, watched a couple of your lectures as has Shashwood. Um, and these are on your YouTube channel and you have a lecture such as like finding fulfilling careers, things of that sort. Um, and you mention the article and you say, I'm um, being a professor or she mentions that being a professor is not what you do, but it's who you are. And so I suppose I'm very interested. I'm sure Shashwood is as well is what, what drives you as a professor and how do you how do you enjoy being a professor especially at london business school a world-renowned university 
So what I really like is that if I define the, the purpose of a professor as the creation and dissemination of knowledge, so let, let's, let's sort of break that up. The creation of knowledge is that you can research whatever you find to be really interesting. So my PhD at MIT, I actually looked at the effect of um, World Cup football results on the stock market. Now that seems a completely crazy thing to look at, but I'm somebody who's really passionate about the sports. And why did I look at that? Because I wanted to show that markets were not efficient. Right, we have the idea of efficient markets, that stock prices are driven by unemployment and dividends and profits, but I wanted to show that it's affected by emotions, and that was what I saw in my time at Morgan Stanley, so I used the World Cup as some shock to national mood. And then when I started to work on responsible business um, towards the end of my PhD, it was a really unpopular topic back then. People thought it was fluffy. If you're a finance person, you should be hard-headed and not think about responsibility. But that was something that I, I was working on before it became um, so popular. So I think dissemination, creation of knowledge is that you can move into these new fields. Yes, it's more established right now, but back when I was writing that paper, it was something that people weren't really taking seriously. But then I think what's really important is the dissemination of knowledge. So um, the first thing I ever taught um, was actually rowing. So at Oxford, where I was an undergrad, right, that is the biggest sport. But the first um, competition of every year, you can only do that if you are a um, beginner. So once I'd done that race, I couldn't do it again. So I had to be a, the, either a coach or a cox. And so you're the person who sits in the boat and you actually coach the um, rowers. And, and then when I was um, came off the outing, after coxing an outing, and the, and the people said to me, that was a really good session that you led. I just felt some immediate feedback. And so that's why I also like the dissemination of knowledge part. So many professors, they do not care about teaching. Right? You get your reputation purely on publication. Teaching is something you just have to do in order to pay the bills because that's what drives the tuition revenue, but you don't get famous out of teaching. But I love that teaching aspect is that if I give a good class, you can immediately see the student's reaction, particularly for um, finance, because some people do come to do an MBA because they want to do marketing or organizational behavior. They don't like something quantitative like finance. So my challenge is to try to make that interesting. And so that's what I do with my teaching. But similarly with my research, why I love doing podcasts like this is to explain maybe something complex, which took me five years to do in terms of a study, but make it same um, in, in practical language and to show why this is something interesting, not just academic. Absolutely so fascinating. Have, so Alex, I have um, some thoughts and a question. Um, you spoke about like, you broke down being a professor as creation of knowledge and then dissemination of knowledge. And we, just before this podcast, we, me and Xavier were looking at your TED talk on the post-truth world um, and talking about knowledge systems and information systems and how there is so much misinformation out on the internet today that is creating this post-truth world where it's becoming harder and harder to be able to know what's right and wrong um, and what, what is the truth to be able to act in a just way that creates more positive impact on the world. And I think dissemination of knowledge systems or dissemination of knowledge plays a core important factor in being able to have uh, a world that is truthful where information and knowledge can allow better decision making. So beyond just dissemination of knowledge uh, as a professor and teaching in classrooms, I'm curious to learn about your perspective on dissemination of knowledge through technology and information systems and how that affects our economy and our decision making based on the e e economy we have today. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I will talk about sort of how I try to do it through, through technology and then what um, sort of the tech industry is doing in, in, in general. So I am quite active on, on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And so previously I thought, well, what, why do you want to do this? Like the people I see on LinkedIn, they will post something like I, I am humble to be invited to be the keynote speaker at this event. And it's a lot of like humble brags. Whereas when I'm my post, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly always I'm talking about some research. Often it's not research done by myself, but if it's a paper that I think is very interesting, um, even if it's sort of contrary to what I think might, what I would like to believe, I think it's my responsibility to put that in. So yeah, um, I think it was just yesterday, I posted something on diversity. Now, 
I'm somebody who would really, I benefit from ethnic diversity initiatives. I strongly believe in diversity. I use female pronouns for the CEO in my book. And that's not just to be token, but I think it's important to recognize that or the, the assumption that CEOs have to be male is a really unfair assumption. Yet, there are many people who say, well, the, the evidence is extremely clear that more diverse boards make better decisions than improve performance. But that's based on really, really flimsy evidence. And I want to say, no, here is a new paper by, not by me, but by somebody at Harvard. And he takes all of the evidence on diversity and actually shows that the evidence is that diversity is neutral, or it might actually be slightly negative. Now, that is an unpalatable um, truth, right? We don't like that to be true. But if that's what the data shows, then that's what it shows. Now, it could still be that even if there is no benefit to diversity or a small cost, I still want to do this because my goal as a company is not to make as, money, as much money as possible. I would also like just to promote diversity for the social and moral reasons. But I think to say it's automatically going to make you more profitable when the evidence doesn't show, show that, that is misleading. Instead, say, yeah, it's not going to make me more money, but actually I still want to do it anyway because that's the world that I would like to promote. And so I think my goal is to, to use technology and the platform that I have through Twitter and LinkedIn to try to post what the truth is, even if I would become much more popular, I mean, I would have gotten far more retweets and, and likes had I said, I'll look at the clear evidence. And then I think what, what does techno, the role that technology plays in general, uh, and this is, I'm going to be sort of admitting my own lack of expertise in this, but I understand that how some of the algorithms work in say Facebook and Twitter is they will try to show you stuff that you will like because that will keep you engaged and you're going to be more willing to comment and retweet. But I think it's the responsibility of technology to make sure that you're seeing not just stuff that you might like, but stuff that you might not like, because that will make sure that you have a clear picture of both the positives and the negatives. And maybe it is working a bit because I did get some comments yesterday saying, oh no, you're, you are totally wrong. Here is some evidence which shows that diversity definitely pays off. And what they will show is some really flimsy study but people um, will just latch onto that because it shows what they would like to be true. But at least they're seeing my post and maybe they're not being completely open to it. But if they are indeed seeing stuff which is against what they're believing, then that is a way of at least trying to show people uh, both sides of the story. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, uh, I couldn't agree more with regards to um, what you were just mentioning about how interesting it can be to try and disseminate information that's not necessarily aligned with your beliefs, but in a pursuit to create a more objective or maybe a more well-rounded understanding of, of a knowledge base, whether that be finance or, you know, diversity, anything of this sort. And I think these are ideas that I, I think you mentioned, uh, you recommended me a book last year it was by matthew syatt called black spot black box thinking and after reading that book i read another one of his books named called rebel ideas which are, those are actually two of my favorite books today um till date and one of the ideas he talks about is cognitive diversity and explores these ideas of what you were just mentioning and um i think it's really important that we maintain and are aware of the cognitive uh, blind spots or um, the cognitive distortions that we're all susceptible to and try to maintain this objective and yet take into account all positions um and that actually leads me to another question that was related to um, economic systems and this idea of purpose versus profit and maybe just to be, give a bit of context, Alex, um, would you be able to maybe r r for the sake of our audience and maybe anyone that's in listening, would you be able to tell us a bit about Grow the Pie? Um, I read it last year when it just released and uh, I think it's fantastic. But maybe for all of our listeners that haven't had a chance to come across your book, maybe just summarize or give the abstract of the book and then I'll go on to the next question. Yeah, absolutely, Xavier. So, so what Grow the Pie is about is the relationship between purpose and profit. So what is the pie to begin with? That is the value that a company creates. And we think that that value can be split either to investors in the form of profits or society in the form of value. So that could be wages to workers or fair prices to customers and so on. And often we view serving society being purposeful as being at the expense of profit. So if a company was to increase its wages, it splits the pie differently. It gives more of the pie to workers, and that must mean there's less around for shareholders. And so indeed some CEOs run their business 
trying to make as much profit as possible. And they think the way to do that is to minimize everybody else's slice of the pie. So they pay people little, they charge maximum prices. So the whole idea of grow the pie is that when you are creating value for wider society, you're not just giving up part of profits, you're growing the pie and actually profits become higher as a byproduct. For example, if you treat work as well by paying them more, but not just pay, but by giving them meaningful work and skills development, they become more motivated, more productive, and therefore you create more profit in the long term. So this question of purpose or profit, actually the word or is wrong. It can be purpose and profit and i think that's really important because when they hear people speak about purpose they think well that sounds great but really companies can't just be about saving the dolphins they need to make money but here i am as a hard-hearted ex-investment banker finance professor and saying well actually even from a finance perspective you should care about purpose because it's something that can actually lead to your company being more successful in the long term and you might think well that sounds sort of great but it sounds too good to be true but this is why my role as a finance professor is to look at the evidence and what it shows is that many many dimensions of purpose do ultimately lead to the company becoming more successful and delivering more value to shareholders in the long term thank you so much for sharing alex this is something i resonate with a lot and it's a dilemma that i've been going through a lot where i'm in my phase in college where i need to decide what I want to do with my career. And, and I came to this, uh, uh, this path where I'm like, okay, do I do something that's purposeful, something that I care about, something maybe in the realm of social impact and sustainability, or should I get that high paying consulting job that my parents expect me to so that I can make profits? And this dilemma, this or that, that thing I've not enjoyed. And I really like what you said that it's not this or that, but this and that. But another question that came to my mind about the nature of our economic system is that why are these two things separate in the first place? Shouldn't society be, or, or an ideal society, a utopian society that I like to think of, be a society where if someone is actually making profit, it means that they're truly adding value to society, not just to the stakeholders, but to the environment, to, to people, to the workers, and they're truly adding value, they're truly impacting people in positive ways, and hence they are making profit. So I see that as my utopia, but obviously that's not the current reality. And I'm, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on why do we need to have purpose and profits separate rather than just one thing? Yes, that's, that's really important. And, and I think you, you raise a really important point. And I think the reason why people view it as purpose or profit is that fixed pie, zero sum mentality is something that we are embedded from when we uh, were, were children, right? So any of the games we play when we're kids, right? If I win, you lose. And so lots of things in life are zero sum. And actually many people who try to argue for business to be reformed also have the fixed pie mentality. They say the only way to make a company more purposeful is if we scrap profits, if we overturn capitalism, if we stop investors and we were, we were and, and so they're viewing capitalism as evil. And I think that's sort of wrong as well. And yes, you get a lot of popularity if you say, oh, I hate business. But actually, I think a solution that works for both is, is, is going to be better. The other reason why I, I think the whole idea of fixed pie mentality is, is quite common is this idea of growing the pie, which I talk about, is realistic, but it takes a long time, right? So if you are investing in your workers, yes, they become more productive and your company becomes more profitable. But I show in my research that this is, takes four to five years for this to fully pay off. And so there's many people who don't look beyond the next year or maybe even the next quarter. So in Wall Street, you have to report your earnings every three months. And so if that's the case, the quickest way to increase profit is by cutting wages, not increasing them. So I think sometimes it's short term horizons, which are, um, which are hindering things. So what does that mean in terms of sort of a, a utopian future, right? If we want to have this mindset, what we need is to have longer term ways of which we're evaluating the performance of companies. So that's very interesting. And me and Zeva actually discussed this very topic of short termism versus long termism and how our mind is conditioned to, to think more about the short-term gains that we can get. 
and how that comes from this economic theory of hyperbolic discounting, right? Where mm -hmm. we're so conditioned to just want that short term and we don't consider the long term impacts of our actions. And something I've been very passionate about or been kind of um, talking about on this podcast, because I think that is the future. And I'd be curious to know what you think on this is if our economic system could account for the true costs, which is true future costs or true future value that an action might bring and have that sort of economy. So if I was to give you an example of this, like a McDonald's burger, a hamburger today would cost a couple of bucks, a couple of dollars at max. But the true cost behind that, that hamburger, I found out that it's more, it's around $200 because of the environmental cost, the cost to personal health. You know, there's so many layers of cost that our economic system sort of ignores, right? And that creates this, this um, long-term kind of like externalities that we don't account for. So something I've been pushing forward is if you are wondering if it is practically possible is whether our knowledge systems can account for the externalities within our economic system. And so if I was, if I was being profitable in that sense, it would mean that I'm actually causing a uh, true value to society in the long term and the short term. Do you think that's actually possible practically speaking? Well, I think it's actually happening already, and that might seem to be a controversial statement. But let me explain, right? So people often, if they want to attack capitalism, they say they hate the fact that it focuses on short-term shareholder value. But actually, shareholder value is an inherently long-term concept. So you learn in basic finance that shareholder value is the present value of all future dividends from now until the end of time. And that's not just something in a textbook. It's something true in reality. So if you look at some of the most valuable companies today are companies like Tesla, where they're not making many profits today, but because the future is electric cars, that's leading to its massive value. So you're absolutely right, Josh, that that profit doesn't capture the future, but the stock price is far more than just current profits. And this is why, indeed, the um, energy companies, which have had to write off a lot of stranded assets, they've suffered in terms of their, their, their stock price. So I do think if you look at the stock price rather than profits, that is something which captures a lot of forward-looking elements. Now, it doesn't capture everything, so I still do think that there should be some, some improvements. And so one of the main improvements to any externality is to tax it, right? So if there's carbon emissions, that's something that can be taxed and that will ensure that not only profits, but the share price takes this into account. Um, if there are certain externalities which are really, really bad, you could just ban them. So something like child labor, for example, that's something which is just, which is outlawed. But I think it's a combination of, of, of the government um, taxing if it's a measurable externality and it can be addressed with taxes like like carbon or sugar taxes recently got introduced in, in the UK um, but I think the stock price is useful and that's really important because the people who say oh let's get rid of shareholder capitalism let's not pay managers according to the stock price I don't think that's right and indeed in chapter five of the book I show that as long as the manager is paid according to the long-term stock price she creates a lot of value not just for society not just for shareholders but for society more generally. So there are a lot of reformers who say, let's scrap the current system, not realising there's many things within the current system that are already good. Yes, it can still be enhanced, but I would rather make enhancements within the current system rather than completely um, try to over overthrow it. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, you mentioned something you, you were both talking about. Um, obviously, the book is focused around data surrounding public companies. And you're mentioning share price, which is a indicator of a public company's um, current, you know, their future projections, um, like you were just saying. Something I'm inter interested in is in regards to this idea of purpose versus profit, profit and being and having that as a false dichotomy. And then with that in the context of individual lives. So Sharshot was mentioning, you know, he had his quandary of um, selecting uh, a job that pays well or selecting something that he's passionate about. And then also in the startup realm, it is slightly different to a public company because assets and, and, and the company's cash flows are very lean and things of these sorts. So I'm wondering how does the idea of purpose and profit apply to not only individual lives, but uh, maybe smaller businesses and maybe businesses that are private companies or even startups. And I'd be interested to see if you've done any research that applies to or found any research that applies to these areas. 
Mm. Love that question, Xavier. So I'll start with the individuals and I'll go to the smaller companies. So in terms of the individuals, I think the short term, long term thing that Shash, you spoke about was is really critical. And that's another reason why I love I'm teaching the importance of physical fitness and health, because that's something where their short term pain by going to the gym and doing a difficult workout, it, it might hurt, it's expensive, there's a time cost, but there's a lot of long term benefits. And I really want to get my students into the habit of doing that. Another thing is I'm extremely stringent to the students about the use of iPhones in class, right? It's a short term distraction, but there's studies which show that this changes how your brain is wired. It means that you can't sit down and focus when you actually try to do um, some work. So then what does that mean in terms of, of, of measurement, right? you're right, we don't have a stop price as a person, but I can come up with metrics that I have in order to think about how much I'm doing my exercise. So I will tell myself I am going to do, I'm going to work out every single day. So I've done that every single day in the lockdown. Now, maybe for others, they might only be able to do it three times a week, but, but that's fine. But we're going to have a measure like that. And that metric can be something which is for, for families. So I know um, another professor at Columbia, um, she's a, a senior professor, her husband's a managing director at Goldman Sachs, so they both have very demanding jobs. And their metric is that only one day a week are they allowed to um, have a dinner, uh, uh, will their children have dinner without both parents being present? Okay, so six days a week, both parents have, have to be um, at every dinner and if somebody wants to travel they can travel one day a week but then the other parent cannot so that makes sure that six days they have dinner as, as a family of four and that, that that's that's really important then going to to um, companies like well, companies don't have a, a stock price but companies can still try to come up with particular measures which are relevant for their purpose um, so for example I'm actually an angel investor in a couple of social enterprises uh, and, and one of them has a mission it's a um, kombucha company it's called Holos H-O-L-O-S so it promotes some um, sort of uh, responsible drinking but one of the things they're really passionate about is human trafficking and they would like to so they're, they're keeping one quarter of shares to go to this uh, foundation to help out survivors of human trafficking and their long-term target is to have one in four employees be a survivor of human trafficking so that's something which is relevant for their business. Now, depending on what other your uh, your other mission it might be, it might be female empowerment or something like that, or it might be something on a customer basis, or it might be well how you're doing manufacturing if you're using resources. But for whatever business you're in, think about the metric which is relevant for you. So a question I have in relation to these metrics. Do you mean that these metrics that we're measuring, whether that's for the self and like things like phys physical workout or being on the phone, uh, things like that, or whether that's for small businesses, these metrics come outside the domain of our economy and our profits or, or our economic value that we're generating? Do you see it as separate? Well, I, I think it's just you, you're keeping score as to what, what you think is useful, right? So we... We, we, we act differently when we keep score. So if you are to run on a treadmill, right, you would run faster if you saw your miles per hour versus if you, if you didn't. And so just similarly in, in, in life, like anything that you think is going to be important, you would like to see how you're doing. So I don't see this as being something which isn't part of like the economic system. It's just you want feedback. And so this is the way of, of getting feedback as to whether you're doing something, um, wh whether you're doing something good or, or, or not. So I would just like this as a, as a, um, as some progress and so for me it might be the number of days I work out per week or it might be I have a target to reduce some of the time I spend in a 10k from uh, 45 minutes to 40 minutes something like that but whatever I have I would like some target to keep myself accountable that makes total sense and I love that because I love the immediate feedback we can get and I recently came about this uh, revolution of this quantified self revolution or basically these different tools and techniques we can use to collect more and more information and data about our day to day life, whether that's physical fitness or our heart rate or there's so many different factors that we can use to calculate these things. Now, why I asked the question about the economy is because I've been thinking about this radical idea and I'm curious to know your thought on this, whether if our economy can account for the information that's being collected about our day-to-day -day interactions. So for example, if it is proven that I will, if I work out, it will cause more benefit to my body 
than an economic system that would reward me for that. And if I was doing things that, would, it, that was being collected, the, the information told me that it was causing more damage to my body or to my environment or um, society than an economic system that would immediately tell me that what you're doing is wrong and it would cut the profits or cut, like it would not allow me to make much money just because I'm doing something that truly doesn't add value. Uh, whether that's personal life or professional, um, it's something I'm, I'm curious about to see whether that could be possible. And I'm wondering if, if you think that's a practical thing that we should pursue. Well, I think it happens anyway. So I don't think we need sort of any change in the economic system to do that, right? It's, there is a lot of evidence that if I'm going to smoke and, and drink a lot and eat a lot of bad food, I'm automatically going to become less healthy. And similarly, if I'm going to work out well and I'm going to get, look at my diet, I'm automatically going to be, be, be healthier. And similarly, this is why my approach to repurposing business, there's many people saying, oh, government should pass laws and so on. But I'm saying, well, my work shows that it is in your interest to care about society because this is going to lead to your business being more successful in the long term. The problem with trying to have sort of a law and economic system is that people can always obey the law without obeying the spirit. So if, if there was a rule that you had to reduce, keep the CEO to work a pay ratio to 100 to 1, right, there's easy ways of getting around that. You just fire all the low paid workers or you make them part time. So um, certainly if there's, there's certain things which are externalities, right, they should be taxed because that's a market failure. But anything else, I think it's much better to get the person or the company to realize that they should be acting in this way for, 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 for their own good, right? So, so for me, yes, the fact that I, um, do exercise and, and eat well, hopefully that has a positive externality and that I will use less health, national health service resources because I'm not going to get ill as much. But I'm going to just say, admit, the reason why I do this is for my own benefit. It's purely selfish. It's that I want to make sure that I, I, I live longer and I'm able to do all the things that I want to do through being able-bodied. Uh, and so why is that? Well, there's a lot of evidence out there on the benefits of health and fitness. And so that's why I'm putting this into practice. And similar, I'll say, well, there's similar evidence, which is now emerging on companies foregoing the short term. And that's, if you're thinking about wider society, that does help you in the long term. Fantastic. Thank you for addressing that question, by the way, Alex. Very interesting take. So I wanted to ask one question and I wanted to maybe challenge an idea that you brought up in the book, Alex. Um, and it was in your first chapter where you mentioned uh, Merck, Merck Pharmaceuticals, and you compare that from memory, you compare Merck's Mectazan donation program to, I think it's Martin Shkreli's, um, uh, how do they increase the price of, um, I think it was a um, HIV drug by 500%. And you, I think you were contrasting those two from memory. Um, I just wanted to maybe give a bit of context to what the Mectazan donation program was. And so, and perhaps uh, you can just feel free to jump in, um, Alex, and let me know if this is a correct characterization. So pharmaceutical company Merck in the, in the eighties um, came up with a, with a medication that prevented or uh, prevented uh, a disease which was known as river blindness and river blindness at the time was very pervasive and it, it led to blindness of many thousands of people. And essentially they came up with this medicine and they donated it completely for free. And I think it was 1987 or the 1980s sometime around that. And the program has been so successful that it's still running to this day. And it's pretty much led to the eradication of river blindness. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex. Um, so an idea that you pose in this book is about how Merck is a principle or a chief case of how pursuing purpose leads to the byproduct of profits and also leads to many other um, net benefits, like, for example, curing people of a lot of suffering, such as blindness and things of these sorts. So after researching Merck and a couple other companies like Theranos, um, Enron, etc., companies that commit unethical behavior, I came across in a case study, an example of Merck in the 2000s, um, where they created an anti-inflammatory medication that known, known as Viox. And Viox in, in its formation in the 90s actually was shown, to, um, was shown to increase the rate of heart attacks by, I think, four or five fold. 
So there was a huge risk with this medication. And despite the risk that was shown through the tests internally in Merck's pharmaceutical um, business, they decided to release the anti, um, anti-inflammatory anti medication and they generated huge profits from this, but it was obviously at the expense of increasing the risk of heart attacks. And so I see here a bit of a, I suppose, a, um, a, a conflict where on one, on one hand, the company in the, in the 80s is doing something, a Mectazan donation program, absolutely free, taking all, in, taking all the internal costs and doing this for the sake of people. And then not like around 20 years later, or maybe 10 years later, um, creating a drug that leads to an increased rate of heart attacks. And although they were aware of that, they chose not to withdraw it until I think six or seven years after its production. So I suppose this is a long, a lot of context before the question, but as citizens, I was, I was wondering, can we rely on companies to be committed to purpose? If an example such as Merck, um, like in the example I just gave you, um, eventually they plunder into gray areas like, um, uh, like, you know, increasing risk of heart attacks. Can we rely on companies staying committed? Yeah, so I, I don't think we can because companies can't be committed because a company cannot make a commitment. Only people can make a commitment. So it's people who make a decision. And so it could be that different people are in charge of the company at, at different times. And also the different times might have different pressures. So Merck introduced Viax in 1999. And what was happening around then, that was the internet bubble with really fast growing companies. And so there was a lot of pressure for other companies to grow as quickly as these internet companies. And so Merck may well have succumbed um, to it at the time. So I think this is a very important was that this suggests that uh, any company which tries to be purposeful, right, you can't rest on your laurels, right? It's, it's very easy to, at some point, maybe milk your reputation, but reputations can take decades to build and you, they can be lost within, within a, a couple of days. Um, so because people are, are really important, this is this shows that what's very important is to ensure succession plans. So when a particular CEO leaves that the next CEO is somebody who is has bought into um, the, the full purpose of the company so sometimes when a CEO leaves they don't mind if their successor is a bad successor because if the company underperforms then you look good in retrospect when actually that's not what we want and so one of the things that I recommend in the book is CEOs be forced to hold shares in their company after they depart to make sure that a purpose continues to be engendered afterwards. So one good example is, is Unilever, where Paul Polman was um, a, 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 obviously a very committed CEO to purpose. Um, he's left, but his successor, Alan Jope, is, 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 seems to be just as committed. And um, maybe this would have happened anyway, but Paul Polman had to hold 500% of his salary in shares in the company one year after his departure, 250% two years after the departure. So it gave him a, a horizon which is um, outlast beyond his tenure. And I think that's very important is to make sure that CEO's horizons are longer than their, their time with the company. Fantastic. And I absolutely love that idea of how it is, we cannot expect companies to be committed because like anything, companies are just the uh, the identity, or as it is the people themselves that are in the organization that drive the decision making and the values that they are the ones that can only stay committed. Um, so- yeah, I just looked up that Roy Vagelos, who was the CEO of Merck when they launched um, the Mexican's donation program, he retired in 1994. Yes, so it's somebody right. else who, who, was, who was there in, in 1999. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so this, this comes to this, I suppose, one of our final questions, which is surrounding Utopia, which I think I'll get Shashua to answer. But I just wanted to provide, some, uh, provide a bit of um, context before that. So I, I think over, as time progresses, we can see companies becoming more aligned with maybe with value or more ethical propositions. Um, and this, you know, an example, like you mentioned, Paul Polman, I think in 2010, I think you mentioned this in your book, how he abolished the um, quarterly earnings report and he did an annual reporting zoning, if I'm not mistaken, and doing things of these sorts that lead to more long-term uh, value uh, creation. And uh, despite that, there are still companies that seem to be profit motivated. So in Australia, to give some context, in 2019, there was a what we call a Royal Commission. And the Royal Commission is essentially a government-mandated investigation into a certain industry. 
and there was an industry into the there was a, a investigation into the finance industry and the findings of this Cabral commission were very damning on uh, banks and in Australia it's very um, there, there's four big banks they control most of the, the market share and so for that reason there were arguments that it was maybe very uncompetitive but nevertheless there was instances where these companies were doing unethical practices and um, there was and there was a, a huge uproar about it. And so there's this, there's this, I guess, dissonance between companies that are starting and moving towards, moving towards a more um, ethical or more uh, value creating mindset, uh, like a pie, a pie, pie economics mindset where they're focused on creating and growing the pie. And then there's also companies that seem to be stuck in this um, maybe traditional or um or this this mode of focusing more on you know uh, meeting shareholder short term shareholder results. So I'll transition to Shashwat now. But we wanted to ask a question about Utopia. So that being said, um, we would we always like to ask this question: that what is your personal utopia? Given all these things that we've spoken about, so in an ideal society, what do you see the role of businesses? What do you see the role of our economy? Uh, and what do you see the role of our individual, like individual people of, that create our society? So what does essentially your utopia look like? Well, I think it's to everybody to have the pie growing mindset. And so what does this involve? I'll start with the individual level, because I think that's where things start, because it's individuals that form companies, is to have this idea that life is not a zero sum game, right? So from when we are kids, we get jealous of, of, of our friends do well, or maybe at university, if somebody else gets the job offer before us, even at London Business School, I, I, I know lots of faculty get envious of you get invited to do a TED talk or your book does well and so on but but you do well doesn't mean that every as other people do badly you should sort of celebrate and be happy for the success of other people and and try and and try to learn from them but we we don't see this we see a lot of envy this is why social media leads to a lot of people um becoming depressed as they see somebody else happy and then well this is at the expense of us so i think how, the whole idea of let's see well how can we celebrate each other's success what can we do to help others and we have seen this in the pandemic so the pandemic has been a really bad thing but one of the nice things is it has led to people thinking and asking themselves the question I say is what is in my hand so that means what are the resources and what's the expertise that I have and how can I use it to help others so one of my friends he's a, a lawyer and because he's relatively affluent he thought well I can go to my local coffee shop and advance purchase three of uh, one, 100 coffees so he's saying well I'm going to give you 300 pounds and that means I'm going to have a, a card of 100 coffees. And each time I go to you, just clip off that, that, that coffee. And that just gave them important liquidity in a crisis. Another of my friends, he's a young 30-year-old guy. He thinks, well, I can do shopping for my elderly neighbours. So he became the local coordinator for this charity called Spare Hand, which helps out um, people who, who were vulnerable in the pandemic. So I think if we go with the mindset of how much value can we actively create in terms of using the talents or the resources to help other people, I think this has, has a lot of positives. And then I think that's something which similarly companies can do. So what we have seen in the pandemic is some companies thinking creatively about what are the resources they have. So Boston, the New England Patriots, which is the, um, as you'll know, Shash, the American football team in, um, in, in Boston, right? They have a, a, a plane and they use that plane to, to ferry some N95 masks from China to Boston. So that was using a resource in a new way. And we have seen perfume companies make sanitizer because obviously perfume uses alcohol and they can repurpose that to make sanitizer. So I think when companies and people think, what is in my hand? How can I use what I have in order to help wider society? And this is not sycophantic, but you both thinking, well, let me try to launch a podcast and to spread some knowledge to other people. And so if we think about, well, how can we actively um, think about creating value? This is key. So often people think responsibility is about doing no harm, right? So don't pollute the environment. Don't mistreat your workers don't as an individual throw litter on the street and that is important but I think we need to shift our mindset to actively doing good because I think given the challenges we have in 2021 it's not enough just to not drop litter 
right? You are called upon if we are privileged and talented to get to go to a great university and so on, and we have talents and skills to try to use that in a positive way, not just to minimize the harm that we're doing. Thank you so much for sharing, Alex. Um, it brought, it, what you said raised one last question in my mind. So it sounds like what you're saying is that we need to go from, um, shift our mindset from the zero sum game uh, kind of mindset to a more positive sum games, more win-win situations for more people. So I'm wondering as to our audience and just to students in our, in this stage of life, how would you say we can create a more positive sum, we can create more positive sum games in our personal lives but also create an economy that uh, that provides a space to create more positive sum games for everyone. I think it's just practice, right? So just think, just practice. How is it that you can help other uh, other people? So um, there there are some initiatives saying, well, let's try and think about doing one act of random kindness to to a person every day. Um, I saw um, one of um, my Barry's bootcamp instructors post something on Instagram recently, which was quite profound, unlike many things on Instagram. He was saying, well, we, we all sort of um, will will, um, uh, will praise a celebrity. If a celebrity says something, we will like the post. But if our friend launches a new business or writes a book, we don't sort of say, uh, advertise this to other people and try to celebrate and bring each other success. So this is why what I try and do in my LinkedIn feed and, and Twitter feed is if I see a good post by other people, why I try to put as much work by other people on, on my feed, not just, just my own work. So if we get into the habit of giving credit to other people and doing what we can to promote the, the good things that other people do, I, I, I think this just changes our mindset.